What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Beauty and the Beast, where the Beast gets to sip on some uh, some delicious wine that's made here locally in the southeast. And I get to look at the face of my beautiful bride and talk to you guys on YouTube. It doesn't get better than that. What's going on, Beauty? How you doing, Miss Kate? Pretty good, pretty good. Just came back from a great dinner. Yeah, we uh, went and hung out tonight and had uh, some bison. And uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, and this video is actually one that we've, she actually wanted to do for the last couple of days. I had no idea that this kind of stuff existed. And I think if it works out, we might continue doing this in the in the future, right? Mm -hmm. So what is the purpose of today's Beauty and the Beast episode? This is going to be um, the Reddit, the subreddit, Unpopular Opinion. So I was reading through all the stories and I picked a couple and I want to read them to you and then you can see if you agree with that unpopular opinion or not. Well, I mean, I always like to walk to the beat of my own drum. So uh, hopefully I agree with the dissenters and uh, I, I agree with the people who, who had the unpopular opinion, unless we're talking about like the Holocaust or something like that. So let's see what's happening. <laughs> No, no, this, this is, is not a Kanye, Kanye thing, thing. okay? <laughs> <laughs> I picked some good ones, not some, like, crazy ones. I, I got to give you mad mad props for your setup over there. You know, I know you're on the other side of the country, but um, that I really like how that's looking there. You're so pretty. Everything looks so nice. I see you got your RGB going. It just looks surreal, and uh, congratulations on your setup. It looks really cool. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So what do you have for me? How many questions are there in this little? Uh... Two, three, four, five. I got five. Okay. Five unpopular opinions. Yeah. These are what people wrote on Reddit and then other people will comment and be like, yeah, right. I don't believe in that or whatever. You know, hit me, hit me. Let's see. And then we're going to answer these together, right? Yeah. Okay. So the first one is. Insidious is not good or scary. So it says, A lot of people I know love this movie. I can't stand it. The score of the movie had made me think it was a spoof for a while, and it, it relied on jump scares too much. And that red-faced guy sucks. <laughs> he is not scary. He looks like the dollar store Darth Maul. <laughs> the amount of people that say it's genuinely scary is shocking to me. You want my answer? Yeah, so do you agree with him? You already know the answer to this. All right, so <laughs> when Insidious came out, um, our 12-year-old was a baby. And uh, we were living in, in Ohio, and we were in a one-bedroom apartment, just starting out, just starting to do this thing called life. And so this movie, Insidious, came out, and we wanted to watch it. And we were watching it in bed, and we had our daughter in between us. And it was nighttime, and as the movie uh, went on and, and the plot continued to thicken and all these moments were happening and that were really, really to us, to me, scary as hell. The guy walking outside the window and then all of a sudden he was in the room. Remember? I was like, oh, by the end of this movie, we had to double check to make sure our daughter was still alive. Uh, we had squeezed because I'm a big, I'm a big dude. So we were squeezing together like this. Um, she was closer to the TV than I was, but I was like reaching over to her and she was like reaching back. And every time something scary happened, we were, you know, squeezing closer and closer and forgetting we had this little infant in between us. And I will say the guy, the red faced dude is like a dollar store, Darth Maul, but it worked. It really did. It worked in this movie to me. I think the movie is genuinely scary. I, I find it really, really difficult to find a horror movie that doesn't have jump scares in it nowadays. And and we're talking 10 years ago when this movie came out. And to me, Insidious, obviously it was good enough. It started the, the, the whole franchise of movies. Um, you know, the James Wan films that continued on on this trajectory, Annabelle, The Conjuring. Mm -hmm. And and those those movies wouldn't have existed had Insidious not been a good enough film. So I don't know what this person's thinking, but I definitely don't agree with their opinion here. What do you think? <laughs> I, I agree with that, but I do see how some people like don't 
like that movie. Like, I could see how some people are agreeing with him. Because, like, remember we showed it to your mom and she was like, this is not scary at all. She hated it. Well, she hated it because my mom, she wants to see someone get de- decapitated as the the beginning credits roll. And, like, when you, you see the name of the movie, you want to see somebody's eyeball get knocked out and fly in between the letters of the name of the film. My mom has no patience. And so she's like, Brent, ain't nothing good happening here. My mom does sound like that, too, unfortunately for us. But um, she just... But yeah, I, I agree that, like... Um I thought it was scary when I first saw it. Like, I thought it was super scary, like, super good. But, um, I guess some people agree with him. Well, I mean, some people are, you know, some people didn't like Smile. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, you know, there's always going to be people who dissent. And I think the people who disagree there are, I think they're outside of the norm, of course. But I just honestly believe they're wrong, so... That's my answer, and I'm sticking to it. Insidious was a, a great horror film. Had a, lo- a lot of legitimate scares. Some really creepy stuff, like when... Um, the, the I forget her name, but uh, the lady was talking, and she saw it. It was, like, sitting behind the boy, and then it screamed at her in the dining room. Remember? Yeah. Yep. And, then, and at the end, that old woman in the house. Man, please. Anybody who thinks that this movie wasn't good is full of shit. <laughs> All right? Let's move on. All right, let's see. Okay, so the next one is most gamers are losers in real life, which is why they act so disrespectful and toxic online. Well, okay. damn, let me hi- let me hide my controllers. <laughs> okay, it says the gamers I'm referring to are the ones that play an unhealthy amount of games and are generally generally just miserable to come in contact with online. These are the ones that you find in competitive games using profanity, in player lobbies, shouting the N-word for no reason, or acting like degenerates for no reason other than to intentionally ruin the experience of everyone around them. Um, This is because they are losers in real life, so they use video games as their method to escape from reality that won't accept them. They, um, they're... There, they can be anything they want and say anything they want and feel safe behind the monitors or television. But as soon as they come up against any level of stress, they lash out because, once again, they're reminded of how miserable their lives actually are. This isn't to put anyone down, but if it applies to you, you should seek professional help and start thinking about turning your life around. Stop playing video games for 12 hours a day, take a shower, clean your place, wash your bedding, get some sunlight, and just... um, Try being a better person before you end up too far gone to redeem yourself. Well, God damn. <laughs> Who hurt this person? What's, what's their name? And you got to find their gamer tag and see what happened. That's yeah. a documentary right there. Shit. Fuck. I had to pick this one. Oh, so, um, do you think gamers are losers in real life? <laughs> <laughs> do, do you think you're a loser? I mean, um, this, no, is, I don't. this is a very blunt, just a broad stroke comment by someone who had a really really bad experience with somebody who was having a really really bad day you know the world that we live in is an uncomfortable world and you're going to deal with people of all facets of life in every facet of life whether it's online playing video games whether it's at work whether it's at subway whether it's on the subway whether you know you're going to deal with people who are having bad days and your ability to deal with those kind of people is what really should matter not their inability to be the person you want them to be. You're going to deal with people cursing. You're going to deal with people saying the N-word. We all know what that makes you think of anyway. Why say the N-word? Uh, we, we, we're going to deal with people who are, you know, upset and angry and filled with venom. You're going to deal with people who are trolls. But that transcends video gaming. That goes to, to real life in a lot of ways. And we have a generation of people who are so pansy that they believe that you can condition society to not have human conditions. And there's always going to be human condition. There's always going to be people upset. There's always going to be a person disenfranchised. There's always going to be a person who wants to create havoc. The Joker character who wants to see the world burn. I think it has very little to do with video gaming and a lot to do with timing. If you're playing a video game and you're dealing with the wrong kind of person, maybe back out of that room. You know, you sit and watch me play The Last of Us. I'm sure there's been times that you could say I was a toxic one in the room, but in my <laughs> mind, 
I had legitimate reason to be extremely upset and voice my opinion. So I don't think that gamers are any more guilty of um, being toxic or being losers than people in the office or people, you know, in the lunchroom or people, you know, driving their cars side by side, flipping each other off. We're human beings and that's something we're all going to have to deal with. And, and crying about it and, and writing a whole litany of words about someone who hurt your feelings and, and, and saying it's gamers because you got obviously offended, I think says more about you than it does about the person who never wrote anything about it, you know? What's your opinion on it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think this dude is just having a bad day. <laughs> I think he just, I don't know, like, he can't just say all gamers are losers in real life and super toxic, because it's a lot of gamers are like super nice to each other and, and talk about other things that they like while they're playing the game together, you know? Yeah, it's like, uh, it sounds like he ran it. He had a bad run. He ran into somebody yeah. and, and they had some words and somebody used the N word. And, you know, you deal with that. I'm a black dude. You're a white woman. You've heard it before. I've been in, in lobbies and you hear, you know, people say that to me. And it's like, you say it just to get an effect. It's like, in my mind, it's like a yo mama joke. You don't know my mother, but you can say yo mama. And some people get upset. You know, I'm in my 40s. So when I hear people say things like that, I understand it's for an effect. And that's why you have to do everything in your power not to give them what they're looking for. Yeah. You agree, pretty lady? Pretty much. Oh, uh, and just so you guys know, Kate, she said we got to uh, play uh, The Last of Us Part 2 now. She <laughs> no, I did not. Yeah, she said we got to definitely play it now because it's going to be part of the, the new TV series in Part 2, so we got to play it. She was really excited about it today. <laughs> I'm just you kidding. You can play it. I'm, she does not want to play it. She's keeping me strong. I was actually considering it. I was like, I may. No. I'm, I'm, looking, no. At, I'm looking at the PS5 right now. I was like. I may just get The Last of Us 2. And she's like, you can play that shit. I ain't fucking with that game. I mean, she does, She talks like that when it's just us. I did not say all that. She's like, fuck that shit right now. Anyway. Um, but all yeah. Right. What's the next one? What you got? It says, how the rise of YouTube and video on demand platforms are creating a generation of whiny, spoiled brats. It says, I was born in 1989. And when I was a kid, people used to watch normal TV, no matter what we were forced to watch it, according to the programming schedule. You could rent a VHS or a DVD, but it wasn't an everyday thing. Therefore, you would immediately understand that things are not always as you want, but that sometimes you have to follow someone else's schedule or decisions. Now, kids can decide to watch what to watch on YouTube, Netflix, Prime Video, etc. whenever they want, so favoring an idea that they decide what to watch. Of course, the parents are the first and biggest source of education, but kids are educated also by their environment. I, it's This is a hard one for me because I kind of agree with it, and part of me is like, eh. It sounds like you're a little bitter because you were late to the party. Now, this person was born in 1989. I was nine years old, so I have a much greater grasp of what they're trying to convey than they do but i also understand that it goes way beyond video on demand youtube things of that nature i was around when youtube was created i saw the beginning of it and i saw it all the way up till now and i understand what it is but youtube isn't the first thing i mean i know what it was like to not be able to communicate with a person and have to run down the road looking for a payphone and and, and i was around in the very short but sweet era of pagers where if, say for instance, you and I, which of course it couldn't have happened because you would have been like two and I would have been 12. But um, if you're trying to page somebody or trying to get in contact with someone, no one had a cell phone. So you page them, you put in 911 or you put in something romantic like I love you and you spell it upside down. That's the only way you can convey a message. And so now people have the freedom to speak, to text, to send gifs, gifs, to send numerous messages send whole movies if you want from one person to another so the world has changed i think it has less to do with youtube and video on demand i think people have uh lost respect for how things used to be because a lot of people don't know how it used to be have you ever used a payphone in your life yeah okay 
I know that. What? Yeah, we used uh, to have payphones all over the place. Okay, I know there was one in Ohio where we used to live, right by Ream. So I didn't know if you ever used one because you grew up in an era ten years after me, and so by the time you were a teenager, cell phones were already out. Right, and it was ubiquitous across the world. Everybody had the little gray Nokia. And then we got like the slider, the big old box. Yeah, but but for me, I, I got to see that come about and then watch it become ubiquitous and everybody have it. I think that our society is probably more so under threat of tyranny from political ideologies and people um, attacking what is natural, like masculinity. And femininity and traditional families, traditional roles, traditional by bi- you know attacking biology, things of that nature. I think that's more of an uh, you know under assault than people turning pansy because of being able to watch what they want to watch. You know. Well, I think I think what he's just trying to say is like it's making them like like brats, just spoiled brats, and like whiny because they want everything right now. They want it now. They want it. They want it instantly. And this generation is just like instant gratification. Well, look, it's not. Now, it's not now, just this generation because you're not a part of this generation, right? But what did you say about the Last of Us? You wanted it all now, right? So th- the point is, yeah, but it's not. It's like I'm not like out there shouting to the world, release all the episodes at one time. Like I'm not whining about it. Like I said it, but I just said it because. Anyone would want that if it's something entertaining. You want just to get on with it. But Instant gratification. Up, yeah, I I grew up though waiting on episodes to come out. So I'm, it's not like I'm just riding in the streets because of it. But it's like kind of this generation now does stuff like that. So what you're saying yeah. is you understand what it's like to wait. You're willing yeah. to wait, and that this generation is really not, not willing to wait, and they don't know what it's like to actually wait. They don't right. know what it's like to go into a blockbuster video, see a movie that they want, see the case, pick up the case, and then, the, and then the actual movie's gone. Yep. You know? um, so, yeah. Exactly. Like I said at the beginning, I think that I partially agree and partially not because I think it go it transcends that particular uh, aspect of life. But um, I do think that this generation is probably the most troubled uh, in, in modern hi- in, in history. Uh, you know, this is the freest nation in the world living in America. Men and women can do whatever they want. People are able to go work and get an education and make money and, and travel. And, you know, look at us. We're married. We're an interracial couple. Gay people are allowed to do whatever they want, marry who they want, do whatever they want to do. But somehow we have more protests and angry people and people complaining about the ills of the past when those people who actually fought in the past would tell them to shut the hell up if they saw the way the world is today. So I think that um, we do have a society of pansies. I think that men and women have uh, been mixed up and flipped upside down by those in power who want to really hurt the dynamic, the strong, the strength dynamic of the country. But um, I think there's there's a lot of optimism and hope that things can turn around in the future with more caring, thoughtful men and women, parents, people who, who love their offspring and understand how society and the government and, and media has really tried to uproot tradition and, and, and what used to be considered normalcy in America. That's my answer. I'm sticking to it. So deep. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's, I don't it's, think it's meant to be that deep, but okay. It's the wine. Um, all right. Next one. Avatar 2 was bad. I watched the movie on the big screen, was impressed by the CGI, but not the story. The tension wasn't uh, built upon until the last minute before the final battle. Every new character was an NPC. The movie itself lasted way too long than it needed to be. And everyone I know says the movie was really good. It wasn't. You're fucking wrong, homie. Um, (laughs) Real talk, you're wrong. Uh, That's why it's an unpopular opinion. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to see what I can agree with there. And and one thing I can agree with, I think that had James Cameron really, really worked hard, he may have been able to shorten the film a little bit. It was a very, very long film. We actually watched it down here. We have a movie theater in our house. And uh, we watched it here. And uh, it was fantastic. We had your sister over. 
Mm-hmm. We watched it, and it was really, really a beautiful experience. I thought the story was phenomenal. I thought that the computer-generated graphics were just uh, top-notch, top-tier. Um, and I thought it was believable because of the whole genesis of the first film. So you have a, a movie where a person can get into a, a, a suit or a contraption and have their, their, their spirit or their soul transferred into an avatar that opens the door for the kind of things that we saw in part two to happen where a person's body might die but their their spirit or their soul is able to be transferred into an avatar and so the idea that it's an unrealistic or the story is not good or the characters are NPCs I, I thought the characters were great I thought the characters were great I didn't expect the main villain to be sim- like the same villain from part one but yeah. we already know that uh, part this film and the next two are all being filmed in unison so it's not just a one part thing by the end of this uh, it's a four part uh, film or it's a three part I'm, I'm trying to remember I think it's three by the end of the last film it's supposed to be a really really phenomenal film but you know um, a lot of times you see movies that are part twos and they, they pale in comparison. They're, they're not, you know, they don't live up to the hype. Very seldom do you get like a Terminator 2 type situation. I wouldn't say Avatar 2 was on the level of like a Terminator 2 movie, but it was definitely in the same sphere and the same spirit of the original. And I would definitely, especially watching years and years later, it came out, what, 10 years later, 11 or 12 years later. Um, I would say that watching, um, Jake Sully, his, his wife, um, Natiri is her name, and then their children, and, and understanding, you know, seeing that dynamic of a human being going to this planet and raising those children and seeing how they turned out, and it felt realistic to me. It did. It felt like that's the kind of thing you would actually see if it was actually possible. I loved the movie. Uh, it's a Blu ray own for sure, in my opinion, and I thought Avatar 2 was amazing. What do you think? <laughs> uh, yes. Um, I thought I thought it was great. I really liked it. Um, I thought there was enough tension, you know, to them trying to learn this new way of life and these people coming after them. And then the audience is waiting to find out what's going on with, you know, his daughter. Remember all that stuff was happening to her and everything? So it's like, I thought it was, the story was good. And, of course, the CGI was amazing. So I really liked it. These... Um, uh, these um these opinions, unpopular opinions, are unpopular for a reason. These yeah. people are cray cray. It's crazy though how we got two movies from completely different decades. How we go from Insidious to Avatar Two, amazing. What else you got, lady? Because I picked them. Okay. All right. Okay. This is the last one. You ready? Yes, ma'am. Elden Ring's open world structure is worse than Dark Souls' more linear gameplay. It says, hold on, before you read this, let me just say this. I had a conversation with my 21 year old yesterday. He'll be 22, June 2nd. Shout out to Brett Jr. What's happening, baby? But I had a conversation with him last night about Elden Ring, and he thought that uh, Bloodborne was a better game, a better experience. And, um, yes, we, we really, because I love Bloodborne. Bloodborne was my, my most fun and enjoyable from software game. Um, honestly, because I didn't get into the souls and demon souls and dark soul stuff years, uh, years in advance. Bloodborne was the first one you and I played together. We beat it together. We fell in love with it. I know you hated it at the beginning. By the end, you loved it. It was one of your favorite games. That's why you got the DLC. Um, uh, but the linear style comparatively with what we got out of Elden Ring is night and day. Um, Elden Ring, to me, will always, for the rest of my life, stand out as one of the greatest games I've ever played. Um, you and I, we played it multiple times, beat the game. Uh, did we beat it twice? Or were we at the, like at the end of part two and then we started playing? Uh, we, we beat it once, got to the end of it again, and then started playing God of War. Yeah. I had to so that's, that's our setup over here, guys. We got... Two flat screens, 4K, um, low latency monitors. We got two PS5s here. You guys have seen the pictures. So we play side by side so we can enjoy things together. But um, Elden Ring is, we got what? We got Demon Souls on, um, or Dark Souls on the Switch. We got uh, uh, we got it on PS5. 
the remake. I mean, we got so many of these these games. I don't think any of them can really compare, in my opinion, to what um, Elden Ring is. Yeah, uh, Elden Ring was just a. To me, it was like a different kind of game than than and I've ever played, and it's like. I don't know, it was a special experience playing. It was that game. really, really hard and, in the beginning, right? And yeah. but, yeah. but you got really good at it and then you started to really you showed me a lot. You guys look, I know that stereotypically the big bloke is the one and the girl needs all the help and she you know, she's trying to figure it out and he's showing her all the ropes. Motherfucker, please. She's done helped me so many in so many ways, in so many games. I'm not gonna even try to rem- remember or remark how many games you've beaten. You're farther in God of War than I am. Much further. Um, and she showed me a lot in Elden Ring. And um, I know that you've really like dug in deep and fell in love with that game. That's why after we beat it the first time, you're like, we got to go back. And uh, and I, I kind of been wanting to play it lately. Really? But then I'm like... What if I don't? I don't remember any of the controls, and it's like I get in there, I'm gonna like get wore out and be super mad, and then want to quit. How would you compare your love for that game for the guy standing behind you? Pull that off your your um, shelf and show everybody what that is. <sighs> My God, that's such a cool piece. She bought that for me. That's the man, the myth, the legend there. Gerald of Rivia. Woo! I, I love that that sculpt. I love the poster that goes with it. We got got it uh, yeah. framed over here. It's so awesome. How would you compare The Witcher 3 to Elden Ring? Oh, man. That was the whole point of that, girl. Oh, <laughs> oh man. Um, I, th- I think I'd have to say The Witcher. But Elden Ring is like, is like right next to it. Like there's not even a space in between them. Now, now I'll tell you guys this because I know my wife. Geralt is the number one part of The Witcher that she loves because he's a, a very masculine, lovable <laughs> character. It's true. He's an attractive guy. He got his you know nine o'clock shadow all the time, and uh, he has a, a very very nice deep voice. If there was a character like that in Elden Ring that that you know was a badass. <laughs> She would, have ch- she would have chose Elden Ring because Elden Ring's gameplay versus The Witcher's gameplay. I think I like Elden Ring's gameplay more. It's just so fine-tuned. It's so fun. Well, that just might be my unpopular op- opinion. Mm-hmm. Well, look, guys, that's our opinion, and we're sticking with it, right, for, for Beauty and the Beast. Let yeah. us know what you guys think in the comments below about these very, very unpopular unpopular opinions <laughs> do you agree with any of them do you side with me do you sign with kate let let us know in the comments below and as always please give a thumbs up and subscribe to the beastly gamer channel if you have not done so yet we're working we're coming back we're building this bad boy up brick by help, brick help the algorithm screw the algorithm right. just just come and, and and just be look sleep next to your computer and wait for us to upload because we'll be here <laughs> oh, thank you guys for hanging out with us on the Beastly Gamer. And I'm Kate. And we'll see you guys next time.